Arctic and our Greenland ice sheets, so not ice caps. Anything floating on the ocean is sea level neutral, but melting the continental ice sheets causes sea level to rise or fall or rise or fall. And, and look, the, the near-term problem is we're about to head to 9 billion people. If we raise sea level even two meters, we've reduced an enormous amount of agriculture. So you have the intersection of 9 billion people with, say, one-quarter reduction in food somewhere in the next 50 to 100 years. And that's disaster. That is total disaster. And that's really the greatest single challenge facing us is the short-term sea level rise, agriculture, and too many mouths to feed. And the biological level, another strange idea for me in your book is that we may not be living in the great age of plant and animal life, but rather in a declining old age of life on this planet. How did I get the idea from so many scientists that we were right now at the peak, the great uh, green golden age of life? Uh, it's funny how all these preconceived notions just go by the wayside. When I was raised in my first classes, I always read, and even as a boy, that the way evolution worked is first there were fish, and then fish gave rise to amphibians, and we had the great age of amphibians, and then we had the age of reptiles, and then an age of mammals. And yet the fossil record tells us that the age of mammals, the first great age of mammals, preceded the dinosaurs. The mammal-like reptiles, the first true mammals of the late Permian age, were wiped out by a greenhouse extinction. Dinosaurs were just a big mistake. There should have never been this age of dinosaurs, but for this very nasty, volcanically produced, very anti-Gaian, very pro median greenhouse extinction that ended the Permian. Now, how do you judge things to be, uh, just getting back to the hypothesis, how do you judge things to be Median versus Gaian, just so our listeners can tune into that idea? Well, again, the, the whole Median scheme of things is that life blunders around, and that there, there's really no, say, planning, there's no sense of optimizing, there's no plan, if you will. Optimization indicates there's a plan somewhere, that somehow things are, are naturally or unnaturally running according to some plan. Well, there's no planning. I mean, evolution is just this dumb tinkerer sort of bouncing around, things that work well, do well for a while until natural changes of the planet and the system makes other things do well. But the sense that there's optimization taking place, I think, is ridiculous. And what it does, it's like a false crutch. And this is where I just am getting on the case of Dr. Lovelock, is that he has the sense now that Gaia will take care of all the human problems. And he used to say that it would be by wiping out the humans, and he keeps going back to that. And I think it really gives us a crutch that shouldn't be used. Well, it, it was helping the environmental movement to be able to get people through to the idea that there's more than strip malls in your job and that, in fact, we may be connected to all of the species, that we have some sense of ourselves as life on this planet. And I don't think that would be harmful. What's your take? No, I absolutely agree with this. I mean, we are certainly just natural creatures, but now we have technology that nothing else has had. So I hate this sense that humans are not part of the natural chain of being, but I do recognize that we do produce spaceships and we do pump carbon dioxide into the atmosphere far faster and far more vigorously than any volcano, than all the volcanoes that have ever been on the planet. It's that double-edged sword again. I think we really need to recognize the size of our footprint clogging through here. And, but secondly, we recognize we are on a dying planet and that either we die with it or we engineer our way through it. We're talking with Dr. Peter Ward about his new book, The Medea Hypothesis. I had a little bit of a problem in the book with your portrayal of nature. Naturally, your field of study has been on past mass extinctions, and, and you find nature can be brutal. But what about all the hundreds of millions of years where life was relatively balanced, like the age of dinosaurs, maybe? Have you forgotten about the good times here on planet Earth? Well, maybe so. Maybe it's the fact that where I study and what I look at are the crises. And the crises, when they happen, are such unbelievable wrenches to evolutionary change. Uh, just this last week, we found the most astounding relationship between past oxygen levels and diversity of life. How many uh, genera, really, how many species there are on the planet at any given time during animal life. And it's phenomenal. I mean, it's just an amazing correlation when oxygen went up through natural causes, the number of species went up, when oxygen goes down, the number of species goes down. It's such a fine thing, controlling the number of species on this planet. Going back to just one or two small variables actually is very powerful. 
but it also says that you've got a very fine, sort of fine-tuning the way life works on this particular planet. And just a slight change in one aspect, the amount of oxygen so controls animal life, it gives a sense of how narrow things really are constructed, if constructed is the right word. Well, now we get to sort of one of the deepest problems, and you've alluded to it, and I'll ask you, as I ask myself, does this sudden knowledge about the horrible past death of life and the coming climate catastrophe, does it temporarily unbalance us sometimes? How do you survive knowing these things? Hmm, well, there's, there's corollaries to that. I've certainly had that thought, and I, I had some little girl after a talk say, you know, I wouldn't want to be you. You just seem like you're carrying the weight of the world on your shoulders. You're poor, depressed man. Uh, I try to keep a sense of humor about it all, but, I mean, certain things come up. For instance, we were, a colleague and I were talking about paleontology. What a wonderful thing. But can the world really afford to have something as esoteric as we paleontologists say in a century from now, if we do have, as I worry, um, two to three meters of sea level rise by then, and we're seeing mass starvation. You know, can we have a space program? How much longer can we afford for NASA to be spending so many billions to get to Mars and the moon when we see this climate catastrophe facing us? So it, it almost looks like triage is coming at us. This might be the last great golden intellectual age where we can dabble in so many things until I think we're going to have to really concentrate on the problem at hand with much greater vigor than we are now. So am I correct to say that, that your science helps you survive personally through knowledge of extreme death events? Yeah, I think it's just the sense that, that the natural world has so many laws and, and that buffet it yet control it in such an interesting way. Intellectually, it's just fascinating to learn more and more about this. And I think at this particular case, I mean, the dinosaurs couldn't see that impact coming. Now, if, if dinosaurs had invented astronomers, they would have been able to see it. Not that they could have changed things, but maybe. I mean, we can see what we're doing. We have, for the first time, can peer into the future. Nothing else has ever been able to do that, and that must has to give us great hope. Well, as we wrap up, I'm wondering, is there uh, something, I, I think it's going to take a little time, maybe a decade, for your new idea about the Medea hypothesis to get out to the public. How can we speed that up, and what do you see its role being in the current debates about climate and about life on this planet? Well, my, my sense of it is that uh, we inherited this Earth. I mean, we, we just sort of stumbled into this intelligence through blind, dumb evolution, and that now we understand the rules, I think, far better than any species ever has. It's, it's really in our hands to figure out which way it's going to go. Uh, it's going to take great intelligence to get this huge swell of humanity through, I think, the next couple of centuries, which are going to be awful, and try to take us to, to me, the, the, the sense of it is, is some centuries from now, we can reduce population to several billions instead of 9 to 15 billion, and we can get back to really sustainable development. And I do mean sustainable through enormous increases in technology where we are having living houses, where we are not running these polluting cars where we don't have to travel so much. I mean, travel is what's really killing our atmosphere. Travel and, and the energy needed to make the conveyances that cause the travel. We get back to, to centralized and use information to do the traveling for us. And so I do see that we can move to really... See, what I think is so funny is that we humans are the only creatures that can really make the world Gaian as, as Lovelock wanted it to be. I mean, there could be this Gaia, and I think it is our intelligence.